How to rebuild a Stuart Models 5A steam engine. And this is part 28, making the eccentric rods. When you buy the casting set for the reversing gear of a Stuart 5A steam engine, they presume you already have one eccentric, but as I bought this 5A in a bit of a scrap condition, it didn't have any eccentrics, so I had to send off to Stuart Models for a pair of castings that make up an eccentric strap. Unfortunately, Stuart Models were out of stock of these parts, so I had to wait until they cast some more. But finally, the parts arrived. And here are the two halves of the eccentric still soldered together, and I'm about to fit the oil cup. Then I drilled two holes for the bolts, one eighth of an inch in diameter, which is tapping size, for four BA bolts. After which I heated up the eccentric strap to melt the solder, and here I'm threading the lower part of the eccentric strap with a 4BA tap, being very careful not to snap it off. Then I drilled out the holes in the upper part of the eccentric strap to 964 of an inch in diameter, and here I'm fitting the bolts that hold the two halves of the eccentric together, and I'll take this opportunity to answer the viewer who commented why didn't I use sockets all the time instead of using open-ended spanners, and here's the answer. No matter how small they are, sockets are often too big for some model engineering applications. At this stage of the rebuild, I mustn't forget to do this. I've drilled a couple of holes in the lower parts of each of the eccentric straps, and this allows me to use an Allen key on the grub screws to easily adjust the position of the eccentric sheaves on the crankshaft, like this. It makes the job of adjusting the eccentric sheaves far quicker than having to remove both of the bolts that hold the eccentric halves together whenever you want to make minor adjustments to the eccentric position relative to the crankshaft. At the moment, one of the eccentric sheaves is slightly tighter than the other. They both rotate, but I think it's time for some machine oil. When parts are tight, I will always use thin machine oil first so that it penetrates. And now the eccentric strap rotates freely on the eccentric sheave. So that's what I've got to so far, but unfortunately now I have to machine these things. These are the castings for the eccentric rods, and I really have been putting this off. I don't like the look of these one bit. There's nothing wrong with the castings, the castings look very good. It's just that it seems like a very hard way of doing the job. Here they are, and the first thing to do is to roughly put them in position and make sure they're going to line up, because they don't look like they are at first, but I'm sure once they're machined they'll be okay. If I was going to fabricate these, and believe me, if I make a mess of these castings, I will be fabricating them, I would make them from three pieces each. The bottom bit, the middle bit, and the top bit. But here goes, I'm going to first of all clean up the castings. And initially, I'm using the disc sander part of my one inch belt sander, because it removes more material. And also it gets very hot. I'm not going to go into the issue about wearing gloves again, I just don't wear gloves. So, next to the belt sander, I have a container full of water, and I dip the part in this water very frequently to keep it cool. That way I can remove all the material without burning my fingers. I'm not looking to pre-finish this part in any way. What I'm doing is trying to make it as square as possible, so it can be held in the forge or chuck to allow me to turn it. This is a difficult job, I must warn you about this. If you're going to try this for the first time, you may have a sleepless night or two thinking about it before you do it. The casting set was quite expensive, and I think possibly the worst part for getting it wrong is the expansion link, and that worked out okay, that sat on the engine looking very nice. This job takes a while, so I'm going to shorten this sequence, because all there is to follow now is about another 10 minutes of this. I'm cleaning up both of the castings, not just one of them, and that's the main reason for shortening this sequence. When I start the machining sequence, I'm only going to show the machining of one of these parts. In this episode, I'm going to show the machining of the base, and the machining of the tapered part, but not the machining of the top part. The machining of the fork in the top of the part will be shown in the next episode, along with fitting it to the eccentric, bolting everything together and adjusting the valve timing before running the engine. That is, if I don't foul up on this job, but it's looking okay so far. And after considerable time, much more than is shown here, I end up with the parts looking like this. They are no longer tapered, and are suitable for holding in the jaws of the four-jaw chuck. When I hold the two castings together now, they are lining up quite well, and when I hold them against the expansion link, I think they're going to be okay. Over now to my little Boxford lathe, and I'm fitting the first of the castings in the four-jaw chuck. And the idea is to get this casting as true as possible, 
so that the knobbly bit on the end runs in the centre, and the thinner end of the tapered part also needs to run centrally. Take your time with this, this part has been cast so that the parts are in line, it's just a case of positioning the part in the four jaw chuck so it all spins true. And don't forget to tighten all the jaws, this needs to be held very securely. I'll speed up the video now because it did take quite a while to get this to run how I wanted it to run in the four jaw chuck. Initially it was nowhere near, but then, after a while, it suddenly was. In this part of the clip, it's not running exactly as I want it to run, so I've made further adjustments. I really did find this difficult, because I was a bit concerned that the part may just snap off once I started machining it. This is a very strange material. It looks like cast iron, and it feels like cast iron, but it doesn't machine like cast iron, and it doesn't machine like steel. I do believe this may be called malleable iron. If you type the word malleable and iron into Google, you will find out quite a lot about it. There's a lot on Google about malleable iron. It must be quite a popular metal. I've changed the angle of the camera so you can see what I'm doing here. By using an Allen key in some big grub screws at each side of the compound slide, this allows me to rotate the compound slide because I need to turn the tapered part of this piece of metal. What I'm trying to do in this clip is duplicate the angle of the taper, first at one end and then the other end. And eventually, by adjusting the compound slide, I'll be able to reduce the tapered part of the casting to the size that I want. So I'm just checking the size that I need it to be by measuring the eccentric strap. Now know how much I have to remove, off we go. I'm using a parting tool for this turning operation. I could use first of all a left hand knife tool and then a right hand knife tool, but I thought, well, this will be simpler. I'd just like to mention that the part of this casting that is furthest away from the four jaw chuck is supported by a live centre. I use a centre drill to drill a centre hole in it, and now the live centre is in place, it's supporting the part very well and allows me to turn it and take fairly heavy cuts. I'd like to apologise for not showing this on the video, because I was a little bit preoccupied with this job. I set up the shot and it looked really good, but I forgot to press record. And once again the word is incompetent, which is distinctly different from the meaning of incontinent. I don't find this particular material very good to machine, it makes a horrible noise, but when I use some emery cloth on it, it polishes up very well, and it looks fine. There's still a fair way to go yet though, this part is still too thick at the bottom. The eccentric is only 3 8 of an inch wide, so this part needs to be less than 3 8 and that's at the wide part. And that's why it's very important to make sure that you have the correct angle set on the compound slide, because if the angle was too steep, you would be removing far too much from the thin end of the part, and then that would be weak. I've now got the component to the finished size, so I'm using some emery cloth to shine it up. This next part of the operation is very scary. I've removed the live centre, so the part is no longer supported at the end that is furthest away from the chuck jaws, and as you can see it's moving around. Really I should have ground this off, it would have been safer, but I like to live dangerously, it's the only excitement to get in my life these days. One down, one to go. There's a big difference between these two components, and getting there was a little bit nerve-wracking, so you have been warned. I cleaned up the end part on the belt sander to remove all the chuck jaw marks, then I drew on it with a felt tip pen. This is the approximate position where I need to remove the metal on the milling machine in the next episode. And the inner part of the fork is thicker than the outer part of the fork. This is not a mistake, it's how it's shown on the drawing. As you can see I've drilled the holes to mount the eccentric rod onto the eccentric and it's quite a good fit, I'm very pleased with this. By the time you see the next episode I will have machined the other part to the same stage as this, so it's just a simple job of milling the fork. That's it for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.